Um, <clears throat> yes, I do, in fact, believe that there is a God. Um, I believe that the mechanism that works behind it is so uh, immaculate and flawless that the only word that we've ever been able to come up with, or you know, the only thing that we've ever known to describe it as, is the word God, and God is real. It, um, it is a, uh, a sort of strange existence when you come into a world and not knowingly, fully, understandingly, you know, coming to terms and grips with reality, but also when rea that reality actually becomes uh, a part of an even greater existence beyond yourself and uh, beyond the limits of imagination and what is extraordinary in our reality, even in our fictions and our dreams and our states of mind that we create, um, it's all the ultimate human force that drives it forward from this time being, and we take it on the existence of God, of the Holy Bible, and we can either take that and accept it, or or live differently by it, and um, I believe today's existence in society, we can easily see what has happened from it, you know what I mean? It, uh, both good things and bad things, you know? Uh, good things come from well, uh, the messages in the Bible, do they do have very good messages. I mean, I don't see why people hate on Christians so much. I really don't. I I myself consider myself, you know, a Christian, and I, at one point in time, I suppose I did, you know, I have said some bad things about Christians, and I, uh, I suppose I, I understand the mindset of it, but now looking back at it, I kind of think of it as a foolish way, and I wonder why I did it. Well... I suppose it works the same way with when I hear people today talk about it. You know, I I guess I'm not in your mindset, so I'm asking you. You know, I mean, like, really, honestly, tell me why you feel like uh, like everybody judges you when, when you talk about God and Jesus being a part of existence, if he is real or not. Or uh, you feel like you, you say Christians judge you. Like, well, maybe there are, are some judgmental Christians. I've met some, but not all Christians are judgmental, and that's not the faith that the Bible teaches. It's not to judge one another. It's supposed to be loving, and even loving of your enemies themselves. You know, you're supposed to pray for your enemies. Um, and it's not exactly where, you know, we're, we're judging anybody. It has nothing to do with judging. Um, you know, I, I suppose, you, you know, I've been there, though. I have. And I've judged other people, and I... At this time, I really wish that I hadn't, but the unfortunate part of human nature is that I understand that that happens sometimes. But when when you, it all comes down to it, throughout my life, I'm just telling you that. I mean, there are so many times that I could have died, and I think of it now as such a foolish waste if I really don't do anything with my life now. Like... Uh, at least leave something behind for somebody to look at or somebody to review on their life and say, yeah, well, he did this and that and that, and, well, at least he did this, or at least tried to make it better. Or, uh, in terms, really, uh, I just wanted to be remembered, right? Anybody wants to be remembered. So I started with my music, and in my music, when I grew up, and um, my life experience started to change in the high school perspective, I, uh, I got more of a hating sort of, uh, vibe that comes into the music, like, I started listening to other bands that their message was that they don't believe in God, and, uh, it doesn't matter if the music believes in God or not to make it sound good, you know, that has nothing to do with it, but the point of it was, is that the music that I was listening to started influencing my music, and it had such a gravitational pull that uh, my lifestyle had kind of morphed around it, and I started becoming more, uh, <clears throat> more of experimental of the use of drugs and alcohol in, uh, in my high school years, uh, more probably psychedelic of nature, and it really wasn't to inspire anybody or say I'm cool. I, uh, it honestly started that way with smoking some pot. Well, I'm not saying that pot well, was a gateway. It just, I decided to use that at that time. The actual first drug I ever used, I uh, took an Adderall. 
one day I remember my my friend pulled it out of his locker and he spit it out into you know a little paper wad and uh, that's what he did with this medication because he didn't like them and he opened it up and was like does anybody want this before I throw it away you know because we were uh, all cleaning out our lockers and the teacher was already in the room after you know basically everybody was done and it was just me and him finishing up and uh, <clears throat> so I tried that and in my life and experience it, it started evolving into more of a habitual habit that I was an everyday thing and I felt that I needed it for school and tried to justify it in that sense and then <clears throat> I suppose I started losing the grips of reality at age 15 um, well it wasn't really losing I you know started tripping I say you know uh, and uh, I tried to see well my experience was quite <clears throat> uh, uh, my word should say illuminating there was a lot of fluorescent colorings and well <clears throat> that's not going to the details and I'll explain this well I was 17 and I, st I started uh, <clears throat> going into the habit of doing diphedramine and de dextromethorphan and uh, then uh, at the age 18 I switched over into uh, lysergic acid still dextromethorphan and I was using diphedramine rarely and I started uh, occasionally using Datura, which is, if anybody knows, the devil's trumpet. And <clears throat> my life started just decaying so fast. I mean, like, the walls and uh, the very perception and the very state of mind that I had at that time really fell down around me. My, my whole entire personality kind of, like, warped into all these, there had to be numbers. You know, like, there had to be times, there had to be certain sect, like, these numbers kept popping up, you know, and I thought that was crazy, absolutely bonkers, driving myself mad, doing acid to the edge of the brink of reality, and, you know, sometimes you would think you'd never come back, you know, do a couple hits of acid, right, and <clears throat> I would take the turn, oh, I just don't, I guess one day, I, uh, I didn't even realize that I was doing it, but and it was like five in the morning, <clears throat> and I sat at the edge of my parents' bed, like just sat there, out of it. My dad woke up and was like, "What are you doing here?" And I, I guess I told him. I just looked at him like blankly, like I was like, "I'm tripping," and he was, he was, it wasn't very funny actually. He, uh, he just was like, uh, "Don't you think you should go to your room?" And he's like, "Oh, I thought I was in my room." Well, I remember that point, and I just got up and left. And I just left as quick as possible. Well, <clears throat> in the long run, what I'm saying is, I've had so many bad experiences. Well, one time I dropped down two boxes of, well, I started doing what they call Skittles, quote-unquote. It wasn't even in the high school era. I already, you know, was out of school, and I was told in jail about it, actually. Shouldn't have listened to anybody in jail, but <clears throat> started tripping on that and started doing it regularly. And then one day, finally, it got to me where I did two boxes, 32 uh, Skittles, which contains dextromethorphan at 30 milligrams, along with 4 milligrams of chloroform metal. <clears throat> well, much of the experience, I don't recall. It was like very very, well, it was very intense, I do remember, the hours felt like days, honestly, like days, like an eternity would never suffice, everything just kept on going on and going on, and, but my feeling is, like, I couldn't even feel my face, anything, any part of my body I couldn't feel, and I couldn't feel if my lungs and heartbeat were working right, right, that was the first thing that started scaring me, was, uh, <clears throat> and that was at, like, five hours in, and then, like, and it was even 12 hours plus now when I got home. And it was like 12 midnight. <clears throat> so it was like, what, 4 o'clock in the morning. And that time I'm tripping probably 15, 16 hours plus still. And it's still so intense. And I, I ended up, uh, I told my mom I gotta go to the hospital. You know, I, and I started like, I woke her up and, uh, they were, they were like, what? Well, anyway, in the long run, 
uh, was that they did a uh, CAT scan and they uh, did some other brain scans just to make sure I didn't have any uh, brain, I guess, uh, damage, whatever, anyway, from uh, dextromethorphan abuse because he said such a high milligram dosage of dextromethorphan could actually cause brain damage. And, uh, well, the results came back, of course, I didn't. Anyway, they said I was fine. You know, they said that my liver and kidney kidney functions were fine, and that uh, I didn't have anything wrong with me, and that I shouldn't do this again, then, you know, I mean, that kind of stuff, just because I thought I was going to die and had such a bad experience, and in the long run, I found that what took it away, my, like, desire to do it, I didn't have a desire really much anymore after, well, I still kept doing it every so often just because it was interesting, but finally, the desire that was taken away it came from asking Jesus Christ to be my Savior and Lord, and that took a lot of effort on my part because it, at first you think it might be just, uh, you know, it's going to be always a roller coaster no matter what, you know, don't get me wrong, but um, on my part, you you take up an effect of, uh, at first, you come into, the, into this mindset that you think, oh, well, maybe I'll try and do this and that. And, but that, that's not what the Bible's trying to teach you. I started to dig more for it because the word God and the word Jesus, the, word, the actual words, because I already been taught what the, it meant, and I just, uh, I already knew who Jesus was, I've already been taught, I just cho chose at that time to reject him, but uh, later on in the future didn't, now, and so my real perspective on it has changed quite dramatically, yes, but what I'm, I guess, supposedly trying to get at is, what is your story? You know, what is your life events? What what do you have to question? What do you have to show for it? What do you have to gain from this life? What do you have to lose? What do you have to, you know, offer? What do you have to show for it? What do you have to create and recreate, obliterate? What do you have? What do you have that makes you who you are? And that's simply what I'm seeing at the point of what God is. God, to me, is what makes me who I am. I'm... I have such personal qualities that are different, you know, some that are, might be alike, some that might be quite challenging to observe from a personal level, or some that might consider me a prick. There might be some people who might consider me um, a discriminating person. I mean, there's all sorts of people out there. And in this today's age and society that we live in, I feel you can't say one thing without a domino effect, without it tumbling down, just as, you know, uh, Paul McCartney had to do. One day he decided to either tell the truth or to tell a lie. So what did he do? He told the truth, like a good man would do. He told the truth. And what happened? Everybody yelled at him for using acid. Well, he's coming clean about it. He told the truth. In my mindset, I consider him a good man for at least telling the truth and telling his audience, well, yeah, I did. But he's saying in this interview, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should. You don't have to, and that's the good part about it. You have the power to say no, not what anybody else does or what anybody else is doing. And that's what it is. And uh, I suppose that's just a spiel for this point. And then from today, maybe some other day I'll have a different one that might be more interesting. Who knows?